All right, so I've got it at four after, and so I'm going to call it now. Greetings. I am Lord, uh, Baron Manus McDay. Um, I hail mundanely from the town of Cary, which is in uh, Windmasters Hill, the Barony of Windmasters Hill, Canton of Elgast. Uh, and I'm here today to talk to you about Roses. I've uh, got a long list of rose classes today. Um, by the way, all of them are on this Zoom link. Um, particularly if if you're interested, um, the um, Q and A, um, which is at two o'clock, um, will be also on this. Even if you haven't signed up for it. If you want to come back, um, I will be running that. It's just going to be an open Q&A on roses. So um, kind of a office hours, so to speak. So um, here we are. Um, so let's go ahead. I'm going to share my screen. As if I can get to the share screen button. There we go. <clears throat> So this is Rose and Roses Then and Now, Roses 101. Um, I like to start with a little bit of Shakespeare. Um, so um, we have, oh, how much more doth beauty beauteous seem by that sweet ornament which truth doth give. The rose looks fair, but fairer we it deem for that sweet odor which doth in it live. The canker bloom says full of deep a dye as a perfumed tincture of the roses. Hang on such thorns and play as wantonly when summer's breath the masked buds discloses. But for their virtue only is their show. They live unwooed and unrespected fade, die to themselves. Sweet roses do not so, for of their sweet deaths are sweetest orders made. And so of you, beauteous and lovely youth, when that shall fade, my verse dispels your truth. So, here, oh, I gotta put the cursor in the page. There we are, there's the Shakespeare sonnet. I forgot to change the screen. All right, so um, just to start out, um, I got started growing roses 20 years ago in earnest, but uh, my interest in roses started many, many years ago when I was very young. Um, uh, before the age of seven, I lived in Washington State and we had a rose garden in the backyard and my father um, picked some of the roses and put them in a local rose show in the uh, junior category, The uh, and one of them won a trophy. It was an owl piggy bank. And someplace in my boxes of stuff at my parents' house, there is still this owl piggy bank that I have. Well, when I moved into my own house, I um, decided that I would uh, combine hobbies. I could now have space to grow roses myself. And I was in the SCA. So, um, that's kind of where I started. Um, and uh, so the summary of this class is a summary of the history of roses uh, from the origin to the modern day. And the bulk of it will talk about which roses are period. We also talk about what the differences between period roses and modern roses is. And if there is a time, uh, we'll do a Q&A of roses, I think. There we go. There's, if I would hit the top, um, the buttons. So um, let's talk about the history of roses a little bit. Uh, roses are a member of the Rosiea family. There are over 300 species of roses um, and tens of thousands of cultivars. Cultivars are the modern or the, the roses that have been bred and are uh, grown they're still all of, of roses, but it, um, it's what we call the different names of the varieties. Um, of those um, species roses, 
um, only about 10 contribute to the roses we cultivate today. Um, they are native to the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, they are mostly found in temperate areas, but can be found from the semi-tropical areas of the foothills of the Himalayas to the subarctic of Scandinavia. Fossil evidence shows that uh, they originated in Asia about 70 million years ago. Um, and we see fossil evidence of them in North America 35 million years ago. The belief is that they originated in what is pretty much now Central Asia, um, but, and then spread from there. Um, so um, they've been cultivated for at least the past 5,000 years. Um, they were known to be cultivated in Babylonia and Assyria. Um, in addition, there's evidence that um, the areas of which uh, the Persian Empire occupied um, are uh, were some of the principal areas where roses got started. Man has had a fascination with roses since basically the beginning of recorded history. Um, they are in myths and legends and have played roles in religion and hygiene. Um, it's one of the reasons why we have uh, rose oil and rose water in so many different cultures. Um, as I say, there, there's evidence in a cave painting in Egypt from the 14th century BCE, and we have records of roses and gardens in China and Greece. Um, notes here. Um, Asia has the largest number of the rose species. Um, in classic times, uh, we have uh, Homer mentioning the roses in, roses in the Iliad, and we have um, the Greek Theophastus called the father of botany, who wrote in the third century BCE that roses differ in the number of their petals, some have five petals, others 12 or 20. A few have as many as 100, but they also differ in their beauty, in their color, and in the sweetness of their scent. He also listed the colors as uh, either red or pink or white flowers. Um, in the first century common era, we have Pliny the Elder, who wrote an extensive multi-volume encyclopedia work called Naturalist Historia or Natural History, and that includes an entire chapter on roses. Um, also in the first century, um, we have Dioscorides, who is a Greek soldier and medic in Emperor Nero's army. Uh, he wrote De Materia Medica, which is a five volume encyclopedia herbal that serves as a model uh, for later herbals. And in particular, there is an illustrated version of this work uh, called the Vienna Discorides, also known as the Juliana Ancia Codex. And it is a Byzantine Greek illustrated manuscript of the book written in about 515 and in Constantinople. Um, and it initially was a luxury copy. It ended up being uh, at the Imperial Hospital in Constantinople where it served as one of the primary medical references for the next thousand years. In the 16th century, it was sold uh, to the, an agent of Emperor Ferdinand I of Austria, and it still resides in the Austrian National Library in Vienna. And you can actually go to the Austrian National Library website and find the scanned version of, of the pages. Um, during the Middle Ages, um, in our period, we have, as Bechtel said in, in his article in the 1950 uh, ARS Rose Annual, 
We know little about roses between the period of the Roman Empire and the early Renaissance. And part of that is because it, roses were not a, really a garden, um, sorry, they were not grown as part of a garden. They were grown as a crop. They were grown as an, for medicinal purposes. They were grown and they, so you really didn't, you know, it would be like recording the different varieties of, of wheat and how much, you know, so you might find that there were records of, of wheat growth, but not really descriptions of wheat or that it was in a particular garden. Um, we do know from monastic records that um, they grew roses in monasteries. We also have uh, the uh, Capitalia de Villas, which um, is attributed to Charlemagne. It's a polypiptic from the Carolingian period, 8th and 9th century France, that describes the management of royal estates, including what plants were grown, and that includes roses. Now, there is a, a legend about Tybalt the Fourth, who was also called uh, Tybalt the Troubadour. Um, he uh, lived from 1201 to 1253. He was the Count of Champagne and Brie, as well as the King of Navarre. And he led the Baron's Crusade in 2039, um, which is between the Sixth and Seventh Crusade. And the story is that he brought back a double form of Rosa Gallica um, and propagated it extensively at his chateau in, uh, in Provence. It was that it is what we now know as the Rose Rosa Gallica officinalis, the apothecary rose. However, some recent studies have said, you know, that's a great, that's a great uh, story. But um, given the champagne fairs and the amount of trade that was going on, there is some um, evidence that these roses were moving th through trade um, and and were probably there prior to Tybald and his escapades in the in the Holy Land, and it just was that when he came back, he he became known as for somebody who was starting to grow roses um, on an industrial scale. Again, we are now in the period where of of the Middle Ages where we are starting to see um, more. More, a little bit more records and the the rise of trade and agriculture and um, and so that is one of the pieces that's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, we have a riddle that's attributed to Albertus Magnus, um, who was the Bishop of Regensburg in the 13th century. On a summer's day in sultry weather, Five brethren were born together. Two had beards and two had none, and the other had but half of one. And so the answer to that, and I'm going to turn off the screen share for a moment, is in fact the rose. And what we've got, if you can see it, is that they, it, is, it refers to the sepals, and it's not really focusing on the sepals here, but um, you can see um, that some of the sepals have this little furry piece here. And, and in this case, this one has it on both. You can kind of see there. And there are, are two sepals that don't have any. Here's one that has some and then there is one sepal right here it's not oh that's that's the other bare one so where is it it's this one this one has just a, a beard on the other side now this is a modern rose this is a hybrid tea and so it doesn't have quite as many um of the 
um, filaments on the sides, the little extensions on the side of some. There are some varieties of roses that have many, many. There, there really are furry. So uh, let me go back to sharing the screen. And oh, 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 come on, get back in there. there. Oh, there we go. There is the answer. As you can see, this is a little bit better picture. And we can see that there are, um, that the one on top has just it on one side. So then there was my demonstration that I got a little bit out of order. And so now we move into the later part of our period. Um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, the Renaissance. Now, roses in the Renaissance, um, we know a little bit more about, uh, also known as the early modern period. We saw the rise of humanism during the Italian Renaissance in the 15th and 16th century. Um, the re part of this was the rediscovery of Greek and Roman writings. And there was also an emphasis on value and agency of human beings. And generally, it preferred uh, critical thinking and evidence, rationalism and empiricism over the acceptance of dogma or superstition. So this is where we started seeing um, people looking at what they what they're find in the Greek and Roman writings and going, well, it says here things like uh, geese come from gooseneck barnacles. That's not really that kind of, that kind of, um, there's like, uh, this doesn't make sense. And so they started seeing that in some of the rose, roses as well as what th was is described by Pliny was not necessarily what they were seeing. And so they started looking at plants in general and animals in general. Um, so we saw and giving uh, more exact descriptions, um, both through visual drawings, etchings, and also um, uh, writ written. So we saw the rise with the beginning of natural history as opposed to what it was kind of before, which was natural philosophy, which was the accurate detailed description and illustration, the naming of things and the development of a nomenclature and the collection of specimens. So we see like here we have um, from the herbarium vivum a pressed rose. So this is a um, uh, an herbarium specimen from period um, <clears throat> showing a rose. And so this was one of the things they started doing is they would press these and they would exchange this and so that they could get, get accurate descriptions. And in this case, we have I started working on doing exactly that myself because you can't take roses very easily across, like there's nothing blooming in February, generally. So if I wanna teach a class and show people actual period roses, I needed a way to be able to transport them. And so that's what I did here. So this is, let me back up here. This is one of my pressed roses. As I have collected my rose specimens, I have done rose, um, pressed roses in the manner of herbarium. So I have the description and where I picked it and what its origin was. Um, and so I've been doing that with my roses as I get and collect them. So I've got about a dozen of these uh, various rose species, all of which rose varieties, all period roses. And with the exception of one, they're all roses that I grew. So back to the presentation.
Roses in modern times. Um, so we we see that the number, I think I went forward one. Okay, so yes, I was forward one. Um, we see post our period, we see the age of exploration and colonization. We see increased trade with Asia and the introduction of Asian roses, the China rose, the tea rose, and other uh, rose species. And um, the significance of this is that um, these roses from Asia would bloom all season long. This is a trait called Ramondin C. Um, it's a genetic trait um, and it is obviously desirable because if a rose will bloom all season long, you can get more blooms and you can get more, in effect, more pleasure out of it. But as a, if you think of roses for the purpose of producing medical or rose water and so forth. Um, so as a crop, obviously it would be a lot better to have that crop last all summer and into the fall rather than just for a short period during the uh, early, during the late spring and early summer. So we have, um, as we go forward in time, we have an explosion in the number of known varieties. So this is just pretty much in the 19th century. You can see that from the beginning of the 19th century, it just blew up. Um, more and more roses were known. Um, among the hybrids that were developed in the 18th and 19th centuries were the bourbon rose, which is a cross between uh, the China rose, Rosa chinensis and Rosa gallica. Uh, evidence shows that it was developed in um, India, and but it got its name from the Ile de Bourbon, which is current, modernly known as Réunion, an island in the South Indian Ocean. Um, we also have the Noisette, which is a cross between the China Rosa and Rosa Machada, the Musk Rose. And those are particularly interesting from, in a way, for our point of view, living in Atlantia, because they actually were developed in Charleston, South Carolina. Now, all this is after our period, so it doesn't, so these roses are not really relevant exactly to what we study, but it's kind of fun to know these roses came into our, came from, came from here. Um, also, we have Portland roses, moss roses, which are a sport of Rosa centifolia. Um, they have very, uh, very bearded sepals. In fact, the, the sepals actually have little glands on them and uh, that exude resin. So they look almost like moss on the sepals themselves. And then the hybrid perpetuals, which um, were a link between the old roses and the modern roses. Um, one of the things about the China roses and the tea roses and some of these others is that they tend to bloom on relatively short stems and and that are not very strong. So they kind of droop. The hybrid perpetuals, we saw the rise of larger blooms and more and, and stronger stems on them that to hold the bloom so they were uh, more, uh, uh, they stood up more. Well, then in 1867, um, Guillot um, introduced La France, the first hybrid tea. So this is the dividing line between old garden roses and modern roses. Um, so in modern varieties, we have hybrid teas, grandifloras, floribundas, polyanthas, climbers, ramblers, shrubs. Um, and so now we get to, um, there we go, um, the meat of the subject, roses in period. These are roses that I have been able to figure out are roses that were grown or existed in Europe 
or surrounding like you know, the Mediterranean basin in prior to um, uh, 1600. We'll start with the Gallica roses. Um, there are a couple of these. Um, one of the things about Gallica roses is that they are generally some shade of red. Uh, we have probably the best known one, the Apothecary Rose, Rosa Gallica officinalis. Um, and I mentioned that when I was talking about Tybalt IV. This is also what um, is thought as the Red Rose of Lancaster. And there is actually a connection between Tybalt and the Lancastrian um, house because uh, Edmund Crutchback was married to the granddaughter of Tybalt IV, I believe it was, um, and for a period of time was the Count of Champagne. Um, and so he then would have, have access to these roses. Um, so that's kind of a link there. Next we have Rosamundi. Uh, this is named, um, after the mistress of Henry the Second, uh, Fair Rosamond, and it is a sport of Rosa Gallica officinalis. So this is a striped variety that is that actually comes from Rosa Gallica officinalis. A sport is a spontaneous mutation that, on that particular cane of the plant. Um, uh, shows that trait. So that trait could be difference in color of the rose, um, in general size of the bloom, uh, long canes. I mean, one of the things that you'll see is that they'll, if you look at a lot of the rose varieties that are available today, you'll see a, a rose like uh, Souvenir de la Malmaison, and then you'll see Souvenir de la Malmaison climbing. Well, the climbing trait, which means that it's putting out extra long canes, is would then be considered a sport. Um, so the thing about sports is they're spontaneous mutations and roses have a tendency to do this and they will sport back. So in fact, if you have a Rosa Gallica officinalis, you'll start, you can start seeing that there's you might get some striped ones, but you also, if you have Rosamundi, you might find that some of your roses are growing back. And so all of a sudden you're starting to see pure red ones in your patches of striped. Um, and in fact, um, when I was um, visiting the uh, Monticello, where they have some large beds, they in fact have to propagate the Rosamundi to keep it because if they don't, their beds of Rosamundi will all convert back to apothecary roses. And so by doing, by propagating it um, through cuttings, they maintain their stock. Tuscany, um, this is a deep red rose, uh, velvety. It's what we believe, uh, is known as the Velvet Rose from Gerard's Herbal of 1597. Um, it is a lovely rose <clears throat> and it, it's hard to find. There is a, a more modern version of it called um, uh, Tuscany Superb that is more easily found. Um, but what we really want is Tuscany so um, if you go looking for roses and you find Tuscany Superb, eh, you're, not, you're not there. Uh, we have Rosa Splendens. Um, this was, yeah, this was the one I showed you, uh, also known as the Frankfurt Rose. This was the pressed rose I showed you. Um, <clears throat> uh, I got a, a bush of that um, a couple of years ago, and it is now taller than I am. Uh, very nice, um, <laughs> very nice plant, and it just was covered in blooms this year. Um, and then lastly, we have Condatorum, 
uh, or the Hungarian rose. Next, we have the Alba roses. Um, ro Albas are um, known as, they tend to be white. So we have Alba semiplena. Um, and it's thought that this might be the white rose of York. We also have Maiden's Blush, which is a subtle pink, um, Rosa Alba Incarnata, and Rosa Alba Maxima. This is a larger white rose. Um, it is also thought called the Jacobite Rose because of the association with the white cockades that the um, Jacobites wore, um, but that's post our period. Um, and then we move into the damask roses. Now damask roses, one of the things about them is that they are um, <clears throat> probably among the best scented roses. Uh, so one of the first ones we've got is the rose in Lan of York and Lancaster. This is Rosa Damascena Versicolor. And um, I don't have one of these, and this is the best photograph I was able to find of this. Um, this, whereas it describes very similarly to Rosamundi, but this is a white rose with pink variegation as opposed to Rosamundi, which would be a red rose with white variegation. Um, Autumn Damask, uh, or also known as Quatre Saison. Now this rose in, is, is very interesting because it is the only rose in our period that was known to bloom more than once in a season. All the rest of the roses would, would start blooming in probably uh, late spring, early summer, and they would bloom for four to six weeks, and then they were done for the year. This rose would repeat, and that generally it would repeat twice. Sorry, it would, it would bloom twice, once in the spring and the second time in the fall. So this rose actually has the Ramondancy gene. And what we now know from a study, a uh, genetic study in, in 2000, is that it is a cross between Rosa Gallica and Rosa Machata, and then that hybrid was, was got crossed, hybridized with Rosa Fedchinkawana. Now Rosa Fedchinkawana is a wild rose native to Central Asia. And it seems very strange. It is, it does have remondency. And so it, it does bloom all year long. But um, it seems very strange that it would, this would happen. But one of the things about the genetic studies showed that it was in fact a very, it happened a long time ago. Um, so we're thinking the study basically says thousands of years ago, this cross happened and the roses that we get today are really the same rose genetic, uh, um, asexually pop propagated through cuttings, um, or, um, suckers or some variety, like some methods like that, whereby the same plant is essentially cloned. Um, and so we then go to Rosa Kazanlik. Um, <clears throat> this is the rose that is grown for its um, uh, scent. Um, it is, um, produces the um, attar of roses um, and is grown and is extensively cultivated in Bulgaria and Turkey. And there have been some genetic studies of the diversity of, of how the, how, how much the different populations of roses um, are different genetically. Um, and what they found is the roses in Bulgaria and Northern Turkey in the, in the big areas where they uh, produce rose oil and attar of roses and so forth are all of the same stock. But then if you move to some of the other areas in Southern Turkey and in Persia, those roses have a different genetic stock um, 
they're not identical. Um, but one of the things about this rose is that it only grows about five feet high, which makes which means that the people who harvest the roses can actually pick all the rose, all the roses. Um, and and so you get um, the a desired feature of it doesn't grow very big. Um, so then we move on to centifolia roses. Centifolia roses are or thousand petaled or hundred petaled rose probably are uh, uh, believed to be a late uh, period hybridization. Um, one of them is Groschot Hollande, the great cabbage of Holland. Um, and so these are the roses that if you look at the uh, still lifes and so forth that came out post period um, out of the Dutch um, paintings, the grand great masters and so forth, we start seeing these these are the roses that are are painted in the in those paintings. Um, we have uh, Rose de Pantra or the painter's rose. And this is another one that I got this year that just bloomed wonderfully. Um, next we move to Centifol uh, sorry to Fidida roses. These are yellow. Now it's called the Austrian Briar, Rose of Fidida. Um, supposedly its smell is not great. I didn't find it that bad, but one of the other pieces of this is that uh, this one is one that um, actively uh, sports because we have the Austrian copper, which is Rosa Fida to buy color. And so these, these two pictures that I just showed you are in fact off the same plant. I, and, and interestingly enough, this is a rose I found at Walmart. Now you're not gonna find this rose at Walmart these days, but back in the early 2000s, I was walking through my local Walmart and looking at the rose plants there and it's like, wait, Austrian briar? That's a period rose. Um, the other thing about this particular rose is it is a black spot magnet. Um, and that's a problem. Um, I no longer have this plant because it would get black spot, all the leaves would fall off, and then um, it would grow back, and then it would happen again. They would get black spot and all the leaves would fall off. And it, over time, you just, it, it just wasn't viable and it died back. And finally it just died one winter. Um, but it is also, um, one of the roses that introduced the yellow color into modern roses. So one of the more famous hybrid tea roses is called Peace. And in fact, either a grandparent or, yeah, I think it's two generations back, um, was uh, Rosa Fidida. And it is one of the reasons why we have black spot susceptibility in, uh, or increased black spot susceptibility in modern roses. Because in order to introduce the yellow, we got the black spot susceptibility too, unfortunately. Now, work has been done to move beyond that. Uh, next, we move to the species roses. Um, the musk rose or Rosa Machata. Um, Gerard said it had long leaves, smooth and shining, and bloomed in July in great clusters. And I can say that my um, uh, musk roses are in the process of blooming now. So that's, they bloom in summer into the fall. Um, so we see here that we've got the single musk rose and also the double musk rose, Rosa Machada Plena. Next, we move to the Sweetbriar, uh, 
also known as Rosa eglantaria or Rosa rubiginosa, and the sulfur rose, Rosa hemispherica. So this is the other yellow rose that was known in period. Um, there is a story that uh, the that Clusius, who was the proctor of the first um, herbar no, um, botanical garden at the University of Leiden, um, and a and he is one of the um, he's a big name in in plants in general um, from that period. He was uh, talking with. Uh, the he was in Vienna talking with uh, um, person from the uh, Ottoman Empire. The uh, anyway, and there was this diorama of a of a garden, and there were these little yellow roses in them, and he asked if those were real and. Uh, and uh, the ambassador, that's who he's talking to, is the ambassador, and said, oh, yes. And so he had some sent, the ambassador had some sent to Clusius, who then imported them into uh, into the Netherlands, which is now the Netherlands, the low country. The problem with this rose is it doesn't grow well in moist, cold climates, which kind of defines Northern Europe. Um, in a lot of ways. Uh, it's best in in drier, sunny climates, Mediterranean, um, the air, more arid areas of the Middle East and Persia. Um, it was identified uh, by Lobel in India um, in during our um, time, but it didn't reach England until 1622. And it wasn't until 1695 that a bush was successfully imported. So this is a rose that one of the problems with it is that when it blooms, if it's it's susceptible to the kind of, of fungal disease that causes the uh, bloom to rot unopened called balling. And so that's just a problem. So it probably would grow great in, uh, in uh, the southwest, like Phoenix, so forth, but doesn't probably wouldn't grow very well here in Atlantia. Uh, we have the Frankfurt rose, um, uh, Rosa Frankfurtana, and the double cinnamon rose called Rosa majalis plena. Um, it's called a cinnamon rose for the color of its bark, not for any scent. Um, next we have the species rose, the dog rose. This is a native rose in Europe. You can actually still see it all over the place. Um, it grows very well. Um, <clears throat> and there is a rose specimen that called, that's called the thousand year rose. And it grows in, uh, against the side of Hildesheim Cathedral in Hildesheim, Germany. Germany. And if in this picture you can see the person in orange, and if everybody knows, uh, that's Sophie, my wife, who is Sophie the Orange. We had an opportunity to visit. It's a city, Hildesheim is a city in Lower Saxony, Germany, just south of Hanover. And um, the Hildesheim Cathedral is known for this particular rose. Uh, in fact, in, in the picture on the right, you can actually see the rose growing in the background. This is in the undercroft of the cathedral. And this is the reliquary. Um, the tale is that uh, pious, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, Ludwig the pious, or maybe his, his uh, cha uh, chaplain, left this reliquary hanging on a branch. When they noticed its loss, they returned but were unable to remove it from the bush. This was taken as a sign from heaven and Ludwig declared that he would build a church on this location. The cathedral was consecrated in 872. Um, so you can see in this, uh, 
that we are in the the undercroft below the apse of the church and there is the rose bush and here we have a picture of the cathedral um, looking down the aisle and uh, and uh, then on the one on the right is a close-up of behind the uh, where you can see through the window that rose bush so uh, this building was twice destroyed by fire once in 1046 and rebuilt in 1061 and during World War II in March of 1945 the city was firebombed by the Allies and the wall of the church actually collapsed on the rose bush eight weeks later as they were cleaning up um, they found 25 new shoots appearing from the roots of the bush uh, under the rubble so in in um, in October of last year um, I had the opportunity to go there and actually see the Tausenjager Rosenstock um, and so this is a couple of pictures of the cathedral um, and its courtyard uh, sorry it's uh, call it a courtyard uh, I'm and um, here we have me looking at the rose and looking at some of the other roses in the area. Um, so at, at the time it was not blooming, but there were wonderful hips on it. Um, and so that the hips being the fruit of the rose. Um, and here we can see the shape of the hip of the rose that I showed you earlier. So this was a wonderful opportunity. This was in fact a, a bucket list item for me. Um, moving on to other native roses, we, uh, we have uh, Rosa spinosissima uh, or the Burnett or Scotch Rose. And this is a rose that grows in the Northern areas. It's, it generally grows very low in rocky areas and so and, and so it is native to Scotland and Scandinavia. We have the evergreen rose, uh, Rosa Sempervirens, um, and we have the field rose, Rosa arvensis. And this is the one of the other candidates for um, the Rose of York um, as it it was a rose that um, was uh, native to native to England. So we have a couple of characteristics of period roses for with one exception they only bloom once a year. In general they tend to be more single or semi double in their rose blooms which means they have fewer petals uh, than modern roses. Uh, the colors generally were simpler pink or white or red uh, with a few yellow. They tend to be much more bushy in their habit and they are hardy in their preferred climate, which is to say that, um, you know, example being the sulfur rose, Rosa hemispherica. Um, if you grow it in, a, in its preferred climate, it's going to grow great. Move it someplace else, it's probably not going to grow very well in Canada. Um, but uh, the basic premise I th take is they didn't really do anything to um, abnormally care for the rose. They weren't spraying them. They weren't babying them. If a rose didn't survive, it didn't survive. So the fact that we have these roses is an indication that they were hardy in their climates. Um, we do have some problems ident with identification of roses. Um, there were few written records and not very detailed. There are plants with the same plant had different names in different places. This is particularly a problem with some of the descriptions in uh, from like Pliny because he basically named roses from cities and we don't really know very much very whether those were different roses the same rose grown in different cities or not and what roses they actually represented we also have the same name for different roses in different places for example um rosa uh 
Gallica officinalis was known as the red damask rose in England for, three th for 300 years. There's the sports and natural variation. <clears throat> I mentioned sports before, and then from natural variation, we have roses will grow a little bit differently based on the soil content, amount of sunlight, um, whether they're north facing or south facing and things like that. We have similar place names like Provence and Provence or Prova. Um, also roses naturally hybridize. Um, so basically really for them a rose was a rose was a rose. They really pretty much didn't differentiate. So there we are. And now I'm open for questions. I ran through this all pretty quickly. So hopefully, um, I haven't been paying attention to the chat. Um, and so let me just take a moment to see if I can get the chat. Not, oh, where did it go? Oh, there we are. So um, are there any questions? Um, yeah. Could you suggest of those period breeds of roses, ones that seem to thrive in in the Atlantia region? Yes, and in fact, that's one of the kind of the subject of the next. Oh, oh yeah, which I'm attending. Class. If you want, I'll just I'll just wait wait until the next right. session. Um, by and large, um, uh, most of the roses that are that are period do pretty well in our area. Um, they, you know, they were grown in, in, uh, they, they will grow in our area. Some of a, a lot of it has to do with your particular microclimate. Right. Um, so, and also like how cold it gets and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah, true. Cause yeah, we're in Eastern North Carolina and it's true that there are other plant varieties that are highly localized, you know, fly, right. Venus, fly, so, fly crabs. So, one of the things, um, soil does make a real difference in that. Yeah. Um, and, and particularly the sandy soil of Eastern North Carolina um, mm -hmm. has some issues. Um, and so I don't know of any of the period roses that are actually um, grafted onto Fortuniana. Um, mm -hmm. Of the roses that are grafted of the period roses that are grafted, they're generally grafted on multiflora, um, but uh, so forth. Um, I'm trying to. Um, well, I'll I'll, 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 I'll be in your next in your next yeah. class as well. So let me let, let that uh, percolate and answer some other questions if there are. Right. Um, let's see. Looking back, um, I see what particular roses were grown in mon monastic gardens. Mostly, it was the Rosa uh, Gallica officinalis, the apothecary rose, um, but also the dog rose would be one that was grown um, because, uh, for a variety of reasons, one of which was that uh, the the hips themselves are very have a lot of vitamin C in them. Did I just freeze up? Can somebody talk to me? I can hear you. Okay, sorry. I it just seemed like I um, was frozen. Your, uh, your video is frozen, though. Okay. Um, looking back, um, you can grow some of these varieties in pots. Um, looking at, uh, would it be crazy to try and start a very small rose garden on the back podio of an apartment complex? Um, it's not impossible. Um, these roses do tend to grow large in general. Um, but again, uh, if particularly if you were to attend my class on um, uh, rooting roses, you'll actually see the white bunch I've got in pots. Um, let's see. Um, Okay, I'm looking through here. Uh, yeah, from 
uh, with regard to the damask rose, if you want a rose that smells really good, get a damask rose. Um, I have damask rose growing in my in my um, rose beds, and I can smell it from hundreds of feet away if the if I'm up uh, if I'm downwind when it's blooming. The only problem is they only bloom once a year. Um, Yes, all of my classes today are recorded. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. Is there any other question that people had? Oh, we're at the time. Um, 